Hi, my name is Amit and I'll be presenting today my progress on the Mikai Hackathon topic of domain shifts between clinical annotators. Uh, so here's an overview of what I'm going to cover in the next uh, about 10 to 15 minutes. I'll start with some motivation for why we're doing this. I'll then go into some experiments with uh, annotation histograms and disagreement scores between the seven annotators. Then we'll look at um, the question of, is there a relationship between lesion size and the annotator disagreement or the data uncertainty? Uh, finally, we'll attempt to visualize these disagreements or data uncertainty with the model uncertainty metrics that have been provided. And then finally, I'll have some uh, acknowledgements listed. I try to cover this in about 10 to 15 minutes. So let's start with the motivations for our experiments. So here's why we are doing this. Um, we want to quantify the impact of annotator variance or the data uncertainty within the multiple sclerosis dataset of white matter lesions in the SHIFTS 2.0 publicly available dataset. We then want to compare how the model uncertainty which has been provided as part of this hackathon task, compares against this data uncertainty or the annotator variance. The underlying question here is how is the data uncertainty even quantified? So we'll try to come up with some, some answers there. Finally, we look at are there any correlations between the model uncertainty metrics, the model prediction accuracy, and the lesion sizes. Uh, this is one thing that came up during discussions in the, in the hackathon weekend about should smaller lesions be harder to predict? So we'll try to answer this as well. So let's start by trying to understand annotator variance or the data uncertainty, the agreements and disagreements between the various annotators that have um, created our ground truth. So here's one way of investigating the level of agreement or the data uncertainty amongst the seven annotators for lesion segmentation. The histogram here on the left is uh, an indicator of the ratio of agreement of voxels, uh, where at least one annotator has marked it as a lesion. The leftmost corner, for example, indicates that about 30% of all of these voxels are marked only by one annotator as being a lesion, where six of them uh, do not think so. The rightmost corner, um, about 15% of all of these voxels have full agreement amongst all the seven annotators. So these variations amongst um, these curves here in the histogram is an indicator of uncertainty. So how do we compare these histograms and come up with a quantitative measure of data uncertainty. Here's where I introduce this value called lesion confidence, where it is just a product of the proportion of the annotators agreeing that a voxel is a lesion, the one out of seven, two out of seven, up to seven out of seven, by the normalized histogram ratio of all the voxels at that level. To understand the scatter plot on the left, the vertical axis is the total lesion volume, which includes any voxel that any of the seven annotators have indicated as a lesion. As you can see here, for the 24 subjects in this data set, we plot the locations and um, the correlation coefficient between this lesion confidence and the total lesion volume is 0.63, which indicates that smaller lesions get lower scores. One of the questions that came up during the hackathon was if we can treat each of the seven annotators equally. Every annotator may not be in quotes equal and hence what we do then is compute a weighted average annotation where these weights come from measuring the difference between the individual annotation and the combination of the seven created using staple. So staple is a good estimate of the optimal combination. And so the distance from staple is a good measure of how accurate that annotator is. 
we come up with this more detailed histogram now and we hypothesize that these variations could be even more useful. So how does this new histogram impact the lesion confidence scatter plot that we saw earlier? The definition is the same, it's just that it's applied now to this new histogram. It appears to be a little more linear, linearly related to the total lesion volume. And uh, it separates these subjects where there's a visual difference between the uncertainty even more than the previous version used to. The correlation coefficient is slightly smaller. However, the new scores appear to stretch the confidence scores wider, for example, Subject 6 and subject 7 are now much farther away from the mean, let's say, than they used to be earlier. Here's an example of low agreements between the seven annotators. In the histogram on the left, we use the unweighted or treating all the seven annotators equally, um, the histogram values, and you see the computed lesion confidence now is 0.32. On the right, you see the weighted histogram, and the lesion confidence in this case is a little lower, uh, it's 0.27. The dice score of the model that is run on this subject with the ground truth is 0.51. On the flip side, here's an example of high agreement or higher agreement between the annotators. On the left, you see the unweighted histogram again, and the lesion confidence computed on that is 0.59. On the right, you see the weighted histogram, and the lesion confidence there is slightly lower, is 0.58. The dice score between the predicted output and the ground truth of a model here is also higher, is 0.86. To contrast, here's an interesting situation where the total lesion volume is extremely small, 347 millimeter cube, and we see the lesion confidence for the unweighted case to be 0.41. However, the dice score of the model here is extremely low, it's 0.15. Now this volume is smaller, but there appears to be slightly better annotator agreement, uh, where more than 10% of the voxels are ones where there is full agreement amongst all the seven annotators. So having spoken of dice scores, let's look at how they relate to the total lesion volume. So in the scatter plot here, the subjects on the top right, let's say 19 and 6, are better performing than the subjects on the bottom left, that's 20 and 8. It's interesting that even small lesion volumes for example, subject 23 on the bottom right show a high dice score even though the lesion volume is lower. The correlation coefficient of the dice score and the total lesion volume is 0.42, which is lower than both versions of the lesion confidence. What this indicates is that the correlation between the data uncertainty and the total lesion volume is higher than the model performance with respect to the total lesion volume. So this brings us to the second question that we'd like to address is, does lesion size really matter for data uncertainty? So this is a quick and dirty analysis. So how do we compute this, right? So we take the mean disagreement volume or the data uncertainty that we computed earlier with the unweighted annotator variance, and we do a connected component separation thresholded by nine voxels. What we get here then is a set of connected components per volume, per subject, and for each of these connected components, we compute the average disagreement values within this volume. Now, what this gives us is a list of connected components, their volumes, and the average disagreements within them. 
Now, the expectation we have is that smaller volumes lead to more disagreement or more uncertainty and larger volumes are easier to segment. So now if we plot the volume of each of these connected components versus the average data uncertainty within these volumes and try to fit a line, here's what we get. For subject one, um, this expectation of a negative trend of higher disagreement or higher uncertainty for smaller volumes does not appear to be true. There does not appear to be really any relation between lesion size and the disagreement within that region. How about other subjects? Here's another example, which is subject four. It appears to sort of follow the same trend as well. What is interesting to here is if you notice the string of blue crosses on the bottom left for a variety of sizes of each of these connected components the average expert disagreement is pretty much the same this indicates again that the size of lesions may not really contribute to how difficult it is to segment them clearly we need to investigate this more but um, it's interesting to know that this negative trend is at least for these subjects, not true. Here's another interesting situation where it's a counterexample where the slope is nearly zero. Now, why is this happening? And this could be due to multiple factors. Our estimate of this annotator disagreement or data uncertainty may not be the best. There could be other ways and they could really um, uh, correlate with the volume. The large lesions could possibly bias this analysis and um, we should filter them out. Um, notice in this case, for example, there's one large lesion of about a thousand millimeter cube. Uh, if we get rid of that, how does the analysis look? So maybe it looks very different. Do you remember the extremely small lesion subject that we looked at earlier? Here's the corresponding plot for that particular subject. And note that there are only three independent lesion regions, connected components, and the scale of the horizontal axis here is an order in magnitude smaller than the other plots. What this points to is that this subject is a um, super out of distribution situation for the model, and hence it also potentially explains the dice score being so low. Here's where exploratory data analysis like this really helps explain potentially why models behave the way they do. And finally, um, this section will try to visualize and quantify this data uncertainty and compare it with the existing model uncertainty metrics. So just to clarify how this uncertainty is computed, we average all the annotator masks unweighted and we do a voxel wise p times 1 minus p where p is the value of that voxel to create an unbiased measure of the variance so zero is good which means certainly foreground or background and 0.25 is the worst we then compare these volumes with the volumes that are generated using the uncertainty methods for the model um, entropy if expected, EPKL, and so on. Here's a quick visual verification of the location correspondences between the disagreement or the data uncertainty on the left, the model uncertainty in the middle, and the ground truth on the right. And you see there are um, sort of locational correspondences. Uh, however, um, the challenge here is to compare them uh, quantitatively. Now, why is this a challenge? So here's an example of the confidence model uncertainty metric, where the scale is inverted between zero to minus one in the middle plot, and the data uncertainty on the left seems to be quite noisy compared to the metric itself. So to summarize, these are some of the challenges with quantitative comparisons. The scales are different 
between each metric and so direct numeric correlation may not be accurate. The data uncertainty also varies between 0 to 0.25 and hence may need to be normalized, which is exactly what we do. We rescale all of these metrics, both the model and the data uncertainties to between 0 and 1 and then do a simple mean average error. So after having rescaled both the data uncertainty volume as well as the model uncertainty volumes as computed using these five methods, we compute the mean square error and the mean average error across all the 24 subjects. And we note that the expected entropy measure appears to be the closest. Admittedly, the differences here are very small, even amongst these five methods, and more investigation is necessary to understand what exactly is happening. This brings me to the end of these experiments, and I'd like to conclude with some acknowledgements. Thank you to the organizers of the Mika Hackathon, to the Task 1 mentors for their starter code, introductory presentation, and very useful discussions through the Discord channel. And finally, to the Shifts 2.0 project for sharing the data to run this analysis on. If you have any thoughts or questions, I'd love to hear more. Thank you.